I, I'll ask you to pray with me. Lord, your word is powerful. And in the end, we need nothing more than you and your word in our lives. But Lord, I ask that what we have seen in your word would be a sweet offering lifted up to you today and that our worship would be pleasing to your eye and that, and that you would rejoice with us as we celebrate the Sermon on the Mount. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I imagine, I imagine a hot, dusty day and the crowds are excited because Jesus is coming to town. And word has spread about this teacher, this rabbi, who knows more than the other rabbis, this man who speaks with authority. And sometimes he speaks in places like this, in churches and synagogues, but sometimes the crowds are so big that he has to go outside. And so the crowds gather around him at the mount, and, and they hear what he has to say, and it's life-changing. And over the last six months, we have been listening to this life-changing message, and it's been changing us. And today, I've asked uh, members of this church to share some ways that, that, this, that these words have come into our lives and changed them. And... It's so important because though these words are almost 2,000 years old, they're not dead. These words are alive. They're alive in you and they're alive in me because these words are the word, the Spirit of God. And so uh, I would ask, if you, if you don't have a copy of the... Of the um, of the, the script, I, I, it's not even a script. All this is, this is just the, um, this is the Sermon on the Mount. It's the entire text of the Sermon on the Mount. Um, she, she needs one over here. And we're going to start by reading together from the verses that we memorized so early on, the Beatitudes. And so I ask that you stand up and respect for the word of God. So everyone, please stand. I will be reading the normal print and I ask you as congregation to read the bold print. And he opened his mouth and taught them saying, blessed are the poor in spirit. The kingdom of blessed are those who mourn. They shall be blessed are the meek. They shall the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. For they shall mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart. For they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers. For they shall be sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they are the prophets who were before you. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Salt and light from Matthew 5, 12 to 16. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives, the li and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Um, these verses, I love these verses. Heather and I have a friend who is a missionary, and 20 years ago, she pointed out the verb that's used in there, and it says, you are the salt, and you are the light. And I just love that idea that it's not about what I do. I don't have to try. I don't, I'm, I mess up all the time. But if we follow Christ, if he is renewing us, 
this is something that just comes out of us. That if we are, like at the end, it talks about um, building a solid foundation by obeying and, and knowing Christ. And if we do that, we will be salt and we will be light. And that, to me, if, is just, wow. Jesus starts the Sermon on the Mount with these truths about us, how we are blessed and how we are salt and light. And then he goes right into the truth about himself, that Christ came to fulfill the law. Jesus said, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. At the heart of the law then, as now, is sacrifice. Surrendering your life completely to God, which none of us can do. Our sinful nature gets in the way. We always want to hold on to something for ourselves. The solution God gave to Moses was to pay with blood. The sacrifice of innocent life to pay for God's people turning away from God. And then Jesus came and he stood on this mountain and he said, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. It must have been devastating for the people there at the time because the scribes and the Pharisees were the best of the best and everyone knew it. If they weren't getting into the kingdom of heaven, then who could? But later, Jesus sat down with his disciples and he made a new deal with them. He took wine and he gave thanks and he said, this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for many. Take it and drink. And then he took bread and he broke it and he gave thanks. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Whenever you eat it, remember me. The next day, Jesus was brutally killed to fulfill the demands of the law. And three days later, he rose from the dead to fulfill the promises of the law, to lead the way for us. If you have committed yourself to Jesus, then we invite you to join us here today. Take some time to pray and make yourself right with God. And then come to the front. Uh, there will be someone on, on this side and on this side to serve, uh, to serve you. Accept the bread, accept the juice, and the blessings from the servers. And I think I may be surprising you because we're having communion really early in the service today. Sarah, you were gonna help me serve. So you should go get the communion now. <laughs> uh, oh. We're good. So we're going to do. Oh, we're going to do communion now. Randall. Oh.
one of them okay all right so I'm doing the one on anger ooh really good so in Matthew 5 21 through 26 I right, says you have heard that it was said to those of old you shall not murder and whoever murders will be liable to judgment but I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council and whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard, and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, 
You will never get out until you have paid the last penny. Anger is a very strong word, and I'm sure all of us have been very angry at times, depending on the situation, but it's something that is not good and healthy for us as a Christian. Let me define anger as the original Webster's Dictionary defined it. A violent passion of the mind, excited by a real or supposed injury, usually accompanied with the propensity to take vengeance or to obtain satisfaction from the offending party. This passion, however, varies in degrees of violence and in ingenious minds may be attended only with a desire to reprove or chide the offender. Anger is also excited by an injury offered to a relation, friend, or party to which one is attached. And some degrees of it may be excited by cruelty, injustice, or oppression offered to those with whom one has no immediate connection, or even to the community of which one is a member. Nor is it unusual to see something of this passion roused by gross absurdities in others, especially in controversy or discussion. Anger may be inflamed till it rises to rage and a temporary delirium. What does anger produce? It produces strife in our lives. It produces hostility, dissension. It causes to use harsh words and gives us foolishness. But what should we do? What should we produce as Christians? We should produce peace in our lives, gentleness in our words, agreement, gentle words, wiseness, and caution. In Ephesians 4.26, Paul says that anger is a foothold for the devil. And James 1.19 through 20 states, for man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. However, 1 Corinthians 13.5 says, Love is not easily angered and keeps no record of wrongs. I'm as guilty as the next person when it comes to anger. Absolutely. We learned it as a child. It wasn't taught to us by our parents. What we do and what we say are usually things we do at a moment's notice. We don't even think about it. Yet, as Jesus taught us when he was confronted with the woman accused of adultery and that she should be stoned to death for her actions, he said, let the person without sin cast the first stone. And of course, everyone walked away. We must consider others above ourselves. Basically, put your feet in the other person's shoes. The context and the venue of your timely outburst can either hurt, confuse, or embarrass. However, a friendly word could bring perspective, help, and healing. When we talk to others about personal things, ease into the conversation. Instead of asking, where have you been for so long, ask, what's been going on in your life? And acknowledge the person or couple that you've missed them. Reassurance and compassion are a part of our Christian walk. Not one of you in here knows what I've been going through on a daily basis. And the same with me for you. You didn't grow up with anyone here, so everyone has a different perspective about everything, including culture, actions, and speech, and vice versa. So keep that in mind when you decide to speak to others or even speak about others. You don't know them intimately like God knows them. God knows us all intimately, whether we like it or not. No need to be angry. There are times we want to be angry, but we shouldn't. Let God take that anger out of your heart and replace it with love. Amen. Amen. Next, next, Jesus talked about lust, and 
and I, when I put out a call for people to, to contribute to this, I was sure lust was one that no one would want to get up and talk about. I've done two sermons on lust. Three? I've done too many sermons on lust here. Um, but it's something that we need to talk about. Jesus was not afraid to talk about it in the sermon. And so uh, one of our members contributed, contributed this. And it, and it, oh, you can't read it on that side. It says, since I was young, I've had to fight the spirit of lust in my life. But with true love on my side, I am victorious. And I want, I just want you to take a moment to, to take this in. This picture. I, I love how facing sin we can see from this facing the sin of, of lust or, or any sin can seem like an overwhelming wave that can crush us completely and take over. But knowing that with Jesus on our side, with when Jesus has our back, when we're, we're when we're putting on the full armor of God that we will emerge triumphant, washed clean in the blood of Jesus. Dave is going to read our next part. So it's about divorce, and it's Matthew chapter 5, 31 to verse 31 to 32. It was said also, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual, sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. It's about all Matthew chapter 5, uh, 33 to 37. Again, you have heard that it will say to those of old, you shall, nev you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God. Or by the earth, for it is its full stool. Or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of great, the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simple, yes or no. Anything more than this, comes from evil. So, um, I'm just going to comment about divorce. And uh, that verse shows that no matter, it, even though nowadays people divorce, um, God hates divorce. And as new married couple, this verse really, um, strengthen us. Thank you. Amen. The next, the next part, um, Sue committed to do this weeks ago and she's unable to be here today, but she recorded 
her message. So you might bear with us. I don't know how clear this is going to come through. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Um, I'm sorry about not joining our special event today. I have a personal thing to take care of, um, but I would like to be part of this event in this way. Please bear with me. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the evil man who injures you. But if anyone strikes you on the right jaw and or cheek, turn to him the other one too. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your undershirt, let him have your coat also. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to him who keeps on begging from you, and do not turn away from him who would borrow from you. Matt chapter 5, verse 38 through 42. This is about retaliation from the Sermon on the Mount. It could be really tough for us to put into action because it is against our nature. Back then, Jewish people were told they had a right to avenge themselves on a person who causes them injury according to what he or she had done to them. However, what Jesus taught about retaliation was totally different from what they had learned and believed. They must have felt the same way as we did when we first read them in the Bible. To be honest with you, my first reaction was like, No God, I'm not you. And then I reluctantly agreed with his teachings, saying, Okay God, I can accept some of your teachings. I'm not going to pay that person back in accordance with what she or he deserves. But I'm not going to give more than what this person asked for. And I will never meet him or her again. My reactions made sense to me for a quite while because, like most of us, I considered myself to be a fairly good person. So when I read the verses, his teaching were too much for me. I thought I was already being good enough to people around me. But as I walked with Jesus, I better understood his intention. He knew me inside and out in the first place because he was 100% God and 100% man. I'm thankful that I, wa I was finally able to realize how sinful, weak, lazy, and selfish I was, and how easily I could lose control of myself and get angry with others. I can't help admitting that even though there were limitations on retaliation, my sinful nature could consume me completely. I finally figured out Jesus wants me to wants me to not fall further into sin by giving more than what was asked for by those who didn't deserve anything from me. But with all those life learning lessons and understanding, the teaching on retaliation was still hard for me to carry out in my daily life. So I tried viewing the verses from a different angle by asking myself some questions. Have I ever been the evil person to people around me on purpose? Have I ever taken advantage of people around me? Have I ever denied someone in need? Have I ever 
avenge it myself on someone more than what he or she deserved, and so on. At first, I answered, most of the time, no, I haven't. But all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit in me reminded me of some verses. The Pharisee took his stand ostentatiously and began to pray thus before and with himself. God, I thank you that I'm not like the rest of the rest of men, extortioners, robbers, swindlers, unrighteous in heart and life, adulterers, or even like this tax collector here. I fast twice a week. I give tithe, uh, I give tithes of all that I gain. Luke chapter 9, verse 11 to 12. And suddenly I realized that I was the evil one who has kept doing evil things to God. I'm the one to him even though he forgave me completely. Perhaps we have been good to all the people around us, but when it comes to what we have kept doing to our Lord Jesus, we are clearly the evil one who God has patiently put up with. I would like to read these verses with just a small change. Would you ponder over it with me? I, Jesus, do not resist you who injures me. But if you strike me on the cheek, I will turn to you the other cheek. And if you should sue me and take my undershirt, I will give you my coat also. If you force me to go one mile, I will go with you two miles. I, Jesus, give to you who keep on begging from me, and I will not turn away if you would borrow from me. I hope someday when we meet him, all of us will be more mature than who we are now. Thank you. In Matthew 5, verse 43 to 45, Jesus says, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his son shine on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. Love your enemy was something that I considered impossible before. But recently, I felt I have a little bit more understanding on this. So that's what I'd like to share today. There is a story of how David loved his enemy Saul from the book of 2 Samuel chapter 21. David had become king of Israel for many years. But now there was a famine in Israel for three consecutive years. So David asked the Lord, why is this famine? And the Lord said, there is blood guilt on Saul and on his house because he put the Gibeonite to death. Uh, the Gibeonites was remnant of Amorite. Joshua and Israel had sworn to let them live, uh, even though later they realized that they had been deceived by the Gibeonite. But King Saul had sought to strike them down in his zeal for the people of Israel. Yet in doing that, he broke the oath Israel made to the Lord. And so David then asked the Gibeonite, what can we do for you to make atonement so that you can bless uh, Israel, the, inher uh, the inheritance of the Lord? 
And they said to King David, Let seven sons of Saul be given to us, so that we may hand them before the Lord at Gibeah of Saul, the chosen of the Lord. So David agreed. He chose two sons and five grandsons of Saul to give to the Gibeonites. And the Gibeonites hand them on the mountain before the Lord, and the seven of them perished together. So then after that, uh, David commanded that the seven bodies to be gathered, and also the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan to be taken from their temporary tomb. And they were all buried in the land of Benjamin, in the tomb of Kish. So that is the fa uh, Saul's father. And then we read in 2 Samuel chapter 21, verse 14 says, and they did all the king commanded, and after that, God responded to the plea for the land. And so from this story, firstly, I see that it's dreadful to be judged by God for Saul and his family, even after Saul's death for so many years, and there was still penalty to be paid by his family uh, because of the sins Saul had committed in his lifetime. And even when David had forgiven Saul, but the Lord had not. Saul was the enemy uh, of David for many years. Yet Saul was not primarily the enemy of David, but the enemy of God. Uh, in the book of First Chronicles, chapter 10, as comments on Saul's life and death like this. So Saul died for his breach of of faith. He broke faith with the Lord in that he did not keep the command of the Lord and also consulted the medium seeking guidance. He did not seek guidance from the Lord and therefore the Lord put him to death and turned the kingdom over to David the son of Jesse. So, uh, so when God said, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, it was right for David not to retaliate against Saul but um, even though he had many very good opportunities, but he didn't. But let the Lord take the course of vengeance in due time. Uh, so secondly, I saw David's love for Saul and his family in gathering the bodies and the bones and giving them a proper burial. So David agreed with the Lord to acknowledge and atone for the sins of Saul. But still he loved Saul and his family as his fellow Israelite. And only after the proper burial and the proper love was shown for Saul, God forgave the nation of Israel and answered their prayers. So it sounds like a very complicated situation. Uh, and a very delicate emotion. So how did David divide things and make proper decisions? Um, well, uh, I have two sons. Um, Teddy is the four-year-old, and then Samuel is a four-month-old. Now, Teddy, Teddy loved his baby brother, Samuel, but sometimes the way he played with Samuel, uh, I felt it's like a little bit, um, little bit rough, so I will stop him. But then uh, one day Teddy argued. He said, but he's my baby brother. I said, he's my son, and you are my son too. So uh, both of them are my sons. In my home, as the mother, I have the authority to divide and to determine their boundaries according to my judgment on things. Now brotherly love exists because of uh, love for mutual parents first. And knowing how to love brothers is related with knowing the heart um, the, of the parents. And we as parents are not <clears throat> always right. But God is the creator of all. From him and through him and to him are all things. So how we relate and treat others, even our enemies, matters to God. Uh, David loved his enemy Saul because David loved God first. He had the spirit of God in him to make known the heart of God and to guide him. And so do we, uh, the children of God. So I ask myself, how do you feel about it? Well, I figured if I let God do the vengeance for me, my enemies could get more severe punishment. So I agreed with the no retaliation principle. But what about love my enemies? It's still hard. So I ask the Lord, why should I love my enemy who ill treats me? And the answer that came to my heart was, because I was also an enemy of God before.
The next section is on uh, giving to the needy. My name is Matthew Ambrosia. I'm one of the elders here, and I hope you're enjoying our, our special worship today. We don't always do it like this, just in case you came in late and didn't hear that. Um, well, let's, let's read through. Well, I'll just point out a couple of parts here. So it says, first, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. I think this is showing us, showing, showing me that I really need to be checking my heart as, as I give. And if we check our heart before we give, then I think most of the time we'll notice that, hmm, I'm doing something because somebody's watching me or somebody even, I have some burden that I give myself or society gives me or other people give me, or other church members, even though they don't mean to, I feel some burden because of that. So I think these verses are really asking us to check our hearts before we give. So I hope that, um, that you will also do that. And that's one reason why here we don't pass around the offering plate. We have a blue box in the back. And so just whenever you feel comfortable, whenever God leads you, you can place whatever you want in the offering a box in the back. And, and we, we don't ask anything from our visitors, okay? This is something that we, are, as members, have committed to each other to, to uh, contribute to the ministry of this church. So, but yes, we just ask that you would check your heart and just give as God leads you and be joyful in your giving. You know, at our church, um, well, let's look at this next part. It says, thus when you give, give to the needy. Okay, when we first read this, I'm guessing 99% of us are thinking physically needy. And that's what my, when I preached on this message a while back, that I kind of focused on the physically needy when I went over this, these verses. But who is really needy? Remember, let's go back to the very beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I think if we look at this and think more spiritual side, we need to be giving to the spiritually needy. And what do they need? They need the gospel, right? And so if you, if you think that way, and we look, look back at these verses, bless... Um, Thus, when you give to the needy, yeah, sound, no trumpet before you. When you're doing, when you're sharing the gospel, you know, don't, also, we're not bragging to each other. Oh, I share the gospel with this person, or, or look at me, look what I did. I, I went out and I witnessed to some people. Okay, so I think we need to think of this also spiritually, also physically, even emotionally. Some people are very needy emotionally, and we need to give. As believers and, and followers of Jesus Christ, we, uh, I'm, I said we, I think this, this is what God has convicted me, so I'm just sharing. I think that's what we're doing today, right? So let's give to those who are physically in need, emotionally in need, and also spiritually, especially spiritually in need. And let's check our hearts as we do that. And so as a church, we are, of course, we're running our ministry here. And then also we have set aside a portion of our, uh, our tithes and offerings that come in. We set aside to give to uh, ministries like Remember New uh, organization. Actually, they've gone worldwide. They started in Thailand. And they uh, try to prevent children from getting into the slave trade. So it's, it's grown into a very big ministry. We're, we're glad to, to contribute to that. Also, uh, Zateo Mission, another orphanage in the Philippines that was started and run by, by people that a lot of us know. So uh, they are giving to the physically in need and also the spiritually in need. And also uh, Women's Hope Center up here in Pohang, not too, about an hour and a half drive from here. Uh, they try to rescue women who are in uh, crisis situations, becoming pregnant, and uh, don't know where else to turn as there's a big, you know, the society, of course, 
especially in Korea, looks down on that and judges people very strictly in those situations. And we need to reach out to those kind of people in hurting and in need physically, emotionally, spiritually. And then, so we're, I feel I need to check my heart when I'm giving. And, you know, we need to be giving to spiritually, emotionally, and physically needy. And then, and then what's the result? It, I see it says, and your father who sees in secret will reward you. No, as a father, when I reward my children, sometimes I reward them to, so that they behave correctly. But usually my reward is much greater than the, the small thing that they do. I think our he Heavenly Father rewards us in the same way. We just do a little bit, and He rewards us abundantly. Not only physically, spiritually, and forevermore. He will bless us with His presence, and we will be with Him forever, which we can't understand how great that reward is. Of course, every re reward He gives us is not because we do something for Him. He doesn't need us to do anything for Him. He loves us, and His grace overflows, and He is glorious in all that He does, not needing anything from us. But as we love Him and respond to Him, then His grace can be poured upon our lives in a greater measure. So, uh, yeah, these verses really spoke to me a lot as I go back and review these verses. And each time we, we read the Sermon on the Mount, these are, each part has deeper meaning as we keep reading and keep digging in to the Word of God. So let's continue to meditate on these verses. Thank you. Next, Jesus talks about prayer. And I want you to stand up and pray with me. We're going to pray in a different way than we usually do. And so I want to connect. I want us to connect with this prayer. And so I'm asking you to just repeat after me. This isn't written down in your handout. So just listen and repeat and pray, pray with me. Our Father. Our Father. My Father, Dad, Appa, our Father who is in heaven, in heaven approaching, in heaven all around us, hallowed be your name, blessed be your name. I love your beautiful name. I love your, name. Your, kingdom come. your kingdom come. Your will be done. Will be done. On, earth On earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come now. Kingdom come now. Into, my life. Into my life. Your will be done by me. Bend my, Bend my will to yours. Use me, Use me. To, make to make earth more like heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Our daily rice. Our daily meat and potatoes. Our daily noodles. I'm sorry, it's almost lunchtime. <laughs> Give me what I need to live. And forgive our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Forgive me as I forgive. Forgive. Help me forgive. And lead us not into temptation, temptation, but deliver us from evil. Don't let me turn to gossip. Don't let me turn to greed. Don't let me turn to cruelty. 
Don't let me turn from you. For the kingdom of heaven is yours. And all the power is yours. And all the glory is yours. Forever and ever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrite, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. Uh, this is verse 16 to 18. It will say that fasting had some purposes to be done in the Old Testament. To repent, mourn, and make an earnest request to God. It can uh, still be done these days, not as common as the time though. It is a great way for us to express our uh, sincerity to our God. However, sometimes our desire for what we request is so strong that we focus on that rather than thinking about the relationship with Him. The preacher, Joe, said that God is the person, not a bending machine. As long as we dedicate ourselves to fast, its purpose and our priority should be communication with Him. I'd like to add another point of view. Fasting self can be understood as a type of worshiping God. I think that uh, hearts from God will be the same, but how to express this can be different according to era or generations. On the days of the Old Testament, fasting was more common than these days. How fasting should be done can be applied to what hearts we should worship with. The kinds of actions of worship can be various. We can worship Him with music, sharing His word, and or enjoying fellowship together. Whatever we do, the only priority for this should be His glory. Sometimes people just pretend to worship in order for others to see themselves as religious ones like that, such image making was common in the Jewish society because religious mind was a part of the atmosphere of the society, which can also affect some social status. Brothers and sisters, uh, let's be reminded that it is God who should be focused on the most rather than ourselves in our lives. What is the chief end of man? Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. The first question and answer of, uh, in the shorter catechism in, of the Westminster Confession of Faith. Before I begin, everyone, please close your eyes if you feel comfortable. Think about all the different parts of the body. What do you hear? When we ate communion, what did you taste? Or now? <laughs> Engage your skin. Breathe. Mm -hmm. 
Now open your eyes. Sight. Blur. Blindness. Eyes. Ever since I was young, I've been intrigued by perspective. I loved that because I was smaller than my parents, I could see angles they couldn't see. I helped them find their keys when they lost them. I knew how dirty it was under the kitchen cabinets. Thankfully, my mom was unaware. I also knew the best place to hide chocolate that they wouldn't find in the back of the Tupperware drawer and in the handmade glass vase from Europe on the hutch. Yes, the most expensive one. But going back to my childhood, na childhood house now is a bit awkward. I can't see what I saw the same way. I'm taller now. Perspective is powerful. And perspective can change. With movement, with time, with growth. And I'm so grateful to share today that in Korea, I feel my eyes are changing. Exactly how and why and in what ways are not yet clear to me. My self-sight feels much more blurry, sometimes black, than clear. But I'd love to share with you the sight that I do have today. The change I feel resonates with Matthew 5, 19 to 24. Jesus says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. What I've sensed the Spirit showing me through this passage is a choice I make about my perspective, about how and what I see. Perhaps it's one of the very few things I do control. How do I see the world? Do I see darkness or do I see light? Do I see scarcity or do I see abundance? Do I see possessions to collect and control or gifts? to enjoy and share? Do I see money to safeguard and clench? Or provision 
to rest in and trust. Do I see problems or do I see grace? Can I see enough? Am I willing to be saved? I've heard, him, I've heard him asking me time and time again, what is it that you choose to see? What is it, Becca, that you choose to see? Friends, what is clear to me is this. As I choose more and more eyes of light, heavy weights are being lifted. And so, to respond to a special gift I received this year, and to explore and to remember this Korea perspective shift, I wrote a poem, and I'd love to share it with you. It's called The Beckoning. Not after me, not beckoning. <clears throat> the beckoning. The sun is here. Let's not delay. The choice is ours to live today. The day he beckons, come taste and touch. I invite you to take and trust, to smell to see, to breathe, to be, to hear and savor, to feel each flavor. I invite you, see light. To view this world, there are two ways, one of nights, and one of days, to stiffen, to soften, to fear, to trust, to darken, oh, sorry, to stiffen, to soften, to restrict, to flow, to dark, to fear, <laughs> to trust to darken, to glow. Which master will you choose? The sun is here, soak in his rays. His voice says, come and learn my ways. Abide, release, and see new sight. My goodness is yours, rest in my might. Eat my body, drink my blood, consume my light, receive my love. And once you then have had your fill, I welcome you to open, to spill, to give the flavors and share the sounds that you have just this morning found, O oh vessel, O oh vase, O oh human race, O oh breath and blood, O oh lung, learn love. In this, your body, live today. Which master will you choose? The sun invites us to light. Today I choose to say, some days are clear. Some days I see clearly. Some days are black. Some days I hardly see at all. And goodness is all around us regardless of our sight. Which master will we choose? The sun invites us to light.
Uh, my section is called Do Not Be Anxious. Um, it's one of the longer passages. So I'm going to read a selection of it, and I'm going to start with the last uh, sentence of Becca's as well. Um, you cannot serve God and money. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And then I'll skip to the bottom. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. S sufficient for the day uh, is its own trouble. Now, um, in my life, and then especially in my family, this scripture keeps coming up, and I'm sure it does for a lot of families and even for a lot of singles. Um, there, there never seems, especially with money, there never seems to be enough. And being in a family that even has uh, two incomes, money still becomes um, a big stressful part in our lives. Which is odd because for me this scripture is really calming. It's, it could be a fantastic Bob Marley song because it's so relaxed. But at the same time we choose to ignore the calmness of it and the peace that this could bring to our lives and we choose to stress about what it tells us not to stress about. Um, and what the world tells us is that if you ever have any problems with money, the solution to that is to just make enough money. But we don't know what that number is, we don't know what enough money is, and it's never enough. So we continue to stress about these things. Um, now, um, in my own life, I'm a person who tends to uh, learn by doing, most often by making mistakes. And um, God decided that this particular passage he would educate me on, which meant I had to do it. Um, and in my third year of university, I found myself poor and hungry at the start of the year. Yeah, um, and I, I'm sure we've all kind of felt like that um, or experienced that. There was actually a point in this year where I held in my hand the last $20 that I had in cash. There was nothing else in my bank account besides what I had in my hand. Um, I had food that I had to buy. I had rent that I had to pay for in the place I was living. I had books um, and I, I, you know, I had clothes and things like this that I had to, that I had to spend and I was living you know, by myself without the support of my family. Um, there was a day where I was walking home from a long day of classes around 10 p.m. or something like that, and within sight of the house I was living in, I almost collapsed because my legs just stopped working, and I realized I hadn't eaten yet that day because I didn't have any money to eat. Um, but this scripture kept coming back to me, and also... Um, one sentence in the Lord's Prayer, um, give me this day my daily bread. That has a, a spiritual component to it, but I took the literal, literal physical component of it, and one uh, translation of the Bible that I would read said, give me bread for today, which was literally my prayer. When I would go to bed with an empty stomach, that was my prayer. And when I woke up in the morning and I didn't know when my next meal was going to be, that was my prayer. But the Lord took care of me every single step. I'm still here. The, the money that I needed to pay rent, the money that I needed for groceries, for books and things like that, came. And I don't know where it came from, but it always came, and it always came at the moment that I needed it, and only the, as much as I needed it. It was never enough that I could save up and be like, okay, I'll, I'll spend this later. It was only that amount. Sometimes it was bonds that my grandparents had put away when I was born had matured. And then I could, I could finally get that money and then that was just enough for that. So um, he always took care of me this way and 
I, I got to a point in my relationship with God where I actually, I stopped stressing about it because I realized there was nothing that I could actually do about it. I was completely helpless. And so I had to surrender my next meal to God and trust that it would come when it would came. And it was really not stressful. It was some of the, the deepest peace that I ever felt in my life because I knew that it wasn't going to be me that did it and I knew that it was going to come. Now, if I contrast that with my current life right now, uh, I'm not single, I have a beautiful family. They're not here today, but if you haven't met them, I hope that you get to. Um, I live in a wonderful house. I have a job that pays regularly. I have a car, which I thought that I'd never have. I have a dog. I have like everything that when I was growing up, I wanted to have. And so you would think that given the lessons that I had learned in the past when I had nothing, that I would be my most happy self and I wouldn't stress about anything. It just so happens to be that I'm a sinful man and that um, that lesson, I haven't fully embraced that lesson yet. I hope to, and I hope to never have to learn it again. Um, but it, it's something that I can, th this scripture is always here, that whenever I do have stress about this, whenever we do worry about this in my family, this scripture is always here and this scripture continue, can you, uh, continually comes up. Now, what I, what I like about the scripture and, and the passage that just comes before it and then it comes after it, it says, um, you cannot serve God and money. Instead, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added to you. If this is um, some place that we can put our faith, I think this is a, a daily thing that we can um, apply to our own lives and feel God's peace come through that. Thank you. Matthew 7, 1 through 6, judging others. Judge not that you be not judged, for with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is the log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Josh preached on this, and I remember one of the things he said that really struck me was, we tend to be a little bit more lenient on ourselves than we are on others. And so uh, Fawn and I wrote a little poem for you. Oh my goodness, did you see that? Yeah, they really had a spat. That man's got a fiery temper. He really made his poor wife simper. He should be drawn and quartered and hung out to dry. I'm glad I'm not married to that kind of guy. What's the wink for? To make you think more. Are you saying I'm like that fool? Well, you do occasionally lose your cool. I'm much more patient than most guys. Then why do I see such anger in your eyes? I'm not angry, you incorrigible minx. Okay, calm down, whatever you think. <laughs> did you see that? I'm not sure what you mean. You judged that man, then did the same thing. Well, I've got good reasons for what I do. You're much more forgiving when the problem is you. <laughs> That's what I'm looking for. That's what I'm looking for. That was even better than I expected. Oh, thank you. Um, please, please stand up with me and... Well, not with me, not next to me, but um, <clears throat> um, sing with me. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Given unto you, seek and ye 
shall find Alleluia 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 next oh you may, you may be seated next I've got a video what do you think is it gonna work you know what I'm gonna I'm gonna bring up the next the next reader Timmy's gonna read about the tree and the fruit um, and we're gonna try <gasps> your Mac hasn't shut down Oh my gosh. Um, Jimmy, why don't you come up, come up and read the next part and hopefully we'll get the video. Oh, <laughs> okay. Matthew seven fifteen through 17. A tree and its fruits. Beware of false prophets who, who come to, to you in sheep's clothing, but in, inwardly are ravenous wolves. You, re, you will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear, does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. And that is the conclusion of the reading of Matthew 7, 15 through 17. Rina, what does it mean to do nice things for other people? Um, tea party. What does it mean to do nice things for other people, Rina? Gingerbread Because I like a gingerbread man. What's it mean to be nice to other people? Um, um do we share birthdays to other people? What else? And um, share toys. And we share toys? Thumbs up. Jesus said that we should do to others what we wish they would do to us. What does that mean to you? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I guess this is uh, all about relationship with others. I guess God teaches us how to live in society very wisely. So my experience, I've been living in Christian community for two years. It has been really, really great. I feel really peaceful and secure because uh, all our neighbors, we follow the Jesus. So we like serve, like help, share all together. So I feel like there is no jealous in here. I never feel like a discrimination or gap between the rich and poor. So I guess the, the, you know, the living like this, the benefits is going to be whole the community. I just had this thought as I was driving to work about what that passage of scripture really means to me. So whatever you wish others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. And it made me think about when I was in middle school, I actually, I had no friends, and that's not an exaggeration, I actually didn't have any friends. And I spent a lot of time just desperately wishing that people would love me. So when I come to this passage of scripture, and it says, do to others what you wish they would do to you, I mean, it's a completely different perspective. It means that 
instead of waiting around wishing that people would love me waiting around and and just bemoaning the lack of love in the world I act first I move first and I reach out to others with love first and you think well how can you do that how can you do that without getting hurt if you just love people you know that they may not may not reciprocate that but that's actually okay because we're talking about something that occurs as part of the transformative power of Jesus in our lives God fills us with his spirit his spirit who is overwhelmingly full of love fulfills us with love and is an in inexhaustible supply of love and so when his spirit is, is in me I now am able to love with complete abandon because I have an inexhaustible supply and I'm able to love people without worrying about getting hurt if they don't love me back because it doesn't matter if they don't love me back I'm full of the love of God So this is from Matthew 7, 21 through 23. <clears throat> Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. So this is actually a verse, very interestingly enough, I randomly picked it when Becca offered it to me, but this is something that I think ever since I came to know Jesus, like when I was about 15, so it's like 10 years now, you know? Um, but we're actually first generation believers in my family and that that's been a a challenge because you find that a lot of times you're it's not easy to just keep planting and building a lot of times you're picking pebbles you know all the lies that satan has planted through the generations of your family and now you're like oh i have to learn to follow jesus what does that look like and so through the years um i've been learning that it's not about the work that God does through you only. It's about the work that he does in you. And sometimes we resist the work that he does in us because it's easier just to look like he's doing work through us. So in other words, it's easy to look spiritual, but not always to follow Christ. Stand up. Last song. And thankfully, it's only two chords. The wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock. And the rain came tumbling down. The rain came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up. And the wise man's house stood firm. The foolish man built his house upon the sand. The foolish man built his house upon the sand. The foolish man built his house upon the sand. And the rain came tumbling down. The rain came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up. And the foolish man's house went splat. So, build your house on the Lord Jesus Christ. Build your house on the Lord Jesus Christ. So build your house on the Lord Jesus Christ and the blessings will come down. Oh, the blessings come down as your prayers go up. 
The blessings come down as your prayers go up. The blessings come down as your prayers go up. So build your house on the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not sure what. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Music is such a powerful way to, to tie these ideas and to build them into your, into your mind. I hope, that, I hope that you've taken pieces of that with you. And if the motions help, then by all means go with it. Um, when they had finished, the people of Redeemer International Community Church looked around at each other in surprise. For they had spoken into each other's lives and into each other's hearts. Not as advice columnists or busybodies or know-it-alls. Not as managers or self-help gurus. Not as nosy neighbors or reality show contestants. They spoke as one who had authority. They spoke as a nation of priests. They spoke with love, compassion, and truth. Not love that they had produced on their own, but the spillover from what God was pouring into their lives. And they knew that they were ready to go into all the world and proclaim the great and good news. The Sermon on the Mount is alive. It is a piece of the truth. It is a part of the Word, and the Word lives. Jesus Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Jesus Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Jesus Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. Go in peace. Yeah, that's...